By the mid-2030s, I believe we can send humans to orbit Mars and return them safely to Earth. And a landing on Mars will follow. And I expect to be around to see it. That was President Obama in 2010. This week, maybe some of you saw it, he put that in writing in an op-ed column on CNN.com. So who's ready to go to Mars? I'm guessing... Yeah? All right. From the green space to Mars. I'm guessing my next guest might sign up. Neil deGrasse Tyson, director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History and host of the podcast and National Geographic Channel TV show Star Talk, which now has an accompanying book. If that's not enough, he's the co-author with fellow astrophysicists Michael Strauss and J. Richard Gott of a new book called Welcome to the Universe, an Astrophysical Tour. Welcome back to WNYC, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Thank you. And welcome to the green space. So the first this is where chat- you are. This is where you hang out on Fridays, at the green yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, we just okay. come out and hang, hang out down You're here. Chilling in the green Whoever space. walks by, you know, <laughs> come on in. Uh, the first chapter of the book, Star Talk, is What Do I Pack for Mars? So are you all set to go? No. Well, so whoever is designing the ships to go to Mars, I want them to send their mother first, right? And if that's safe enough for their like closest family members, then I'll consider uh, going. But yeah, if you're going to send me to space, give me a destination. None of this, you know, driving around the block, <laughs> boldly going where hundreds have gone before. You know, this low Earth orbit stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's 50 years old that we've been doing that, and it's, it's time to go somewhere. And by the way, there's plenty of reasons to do so. It's not just for science. You can do it for tourism. You could do it for business reasons, even. And that may be the ultimate driver of it all, to turn a space program into a space industry. Yeah, because it is something that people may not have their minds around in terms of the reasons to go for a destination that's far away. I mean, low orbit may not be sexy, but my understanding is there's a lot of science that can be done because you're out of the Earth's atmosphere that's very applicable to life on Earth. Uh, And there are some people who criticize spending a lot of money when there's still so much poverty on Earth and other problems on Earth uh, to go gallivanting around uh, even the solar system. Yeah, I have heard less of that lately than in the old days. It used to be we can put a man on the moon, but we can't solve the poverty problem. Well, interesting fact today, we can't put a man on the moon. <laughs> you, know, you can't even invoke that, actually. But, but I think people do see space a little differently now, uh, especially since we know that you find grandma's house with a GPS locating system on a smartphone that involves... Um, assets that uh, many of them are, are ground-based, of course, but uh, just the space, uh, sp- space. Um, so your phone's access to that information is from towers, but the satellites are orbiting the Earth. So space as a frontier of discovery and of ways that life on Earth can improve. Just think about this. Suppose we're all in the cave. This twenty thousand years ago, we're all in the cave, and someone is ill, and other people in the cave say, I want to go explore across the valley. Someone says, no, let's solve all our problems in the cave first before anyone leaves the cave. That, today you'd look at that as a stupid decision because cures and food and, and water and all sources of way, ways to keep you alive exist outside of the cave. And so to say, no, we have these problems and we're, we're going to solve them first, that's just short-sighted. So, listeners, you know, uh, some of you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson introduces himself on Star Talk as your personal astrophysicist. <laughs> so now's your chance to ask him some questions. Uh, raise your ha- hands if you're here in the green space, and we'll come around with microphones. Or, listeners, call us 212-433-WNYC, 9-2. A, a quick point about the clip that you played of President Obama. Yes. I was at that speech. It was, he gave it at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And it was, uh, I, what concerned me about it is when Kennedy said, let's put a man on the moon, return him safely to Earth before the decade is out, most of that time would have been under his watch had he not been shot and had he uh, gotten a second term, which is not unrealistic in the day. So he was prepared to invest political and financial capital 
to that goal. But now we live in a time where President Obama can say, oh, in the 2030s, we'll go to Mars, under a president to be named later on a budget line not yet established. And so I don't know what it means for a president to commit multiple elections in the future relative to what Kennedy did in the 60s. Interesting. Uh, we have a clip from Star Talk to Play. This is you with Whoopi Goldberg. Um, and actually, before we do that, why don't you set this up a little bit? Because you describe Star Talk as being where science and pop culture collide. So you interview a mix of pop culture and science figures? No, no. It's m well, occasionally there's a science figure, but if, if I interview a scientist, it's because they're into something else that directly affects pop culture. And so the, the goal of Star Talk is not to bring you science as the focus. It is, we have celebrities hewn from pop culture, people you've heard of, even if you're not even necessarily a follower of theirs. So Whoopi Goldberg is a great example. And in that interview, I'd like to think I've provided a geek safe space for the celebrity to share with me secrets they might have about, you know, have they memorized digits of pi and they can't tell their friends? Or, or you know, do they have any secret fantasies about, uh, is there some uh, bit of curiosity within them that just needs to be fanned, some embers that we can ignite? And so, so with Whoopi Goldberg, we learn that she's, she's totally into the superhero genre and she shares her thoughts on this. And in this clip, what she wants in a superhero superhero. And I guess we'll get that Whoopi Goldberg clip in a minute. <laughs> Let's try it I'm again. A, a... If it's the case that one day we no, can no, have compute... Brian Green, Monday. Yeah, I know. Yes, we have, yes. yeah, that's the second clip. Here we go. Here's Whoopi. But... I think. <laughs> that's the present. The pre I'm a, a woman of a certain age who's always grown up with... Uh, Superman and Batman and Supergirl and all and all of the DC and and uh, Marvel, yeah. Marvel universes and there's nothing out there for us mm. for women of a certain age. I want to see, you know, somebody who saves the earth who looks a little bit like me, whose behind is a little bit bigger, <laughs> whose chest is on the floor. <laughs> but when that is a superpowers <laughs> kick in, ooh. <laughs> She could slap a whole nation of people on the way to taking care of business. That's what I want. I don't think. So, so I, I don't think Donald Trump's reading that comic book. No, no, I know, I know, but uh, I, so I don't know where else someone with the with the stature, the the pop culture stature of. Whoopi Goldberg would be able to share that kind of sentiment. And so, like I said, it's a safe space for that. But what we do is you come for the celebrity, but in fact, the, the whole conversation that unfolds is all about science. And it's a way to clad science onto the scaffold that is pop culture that we all bring to the table. Superheroes and super colliders. Let's take a question from the audience yeah. right over there. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Hello. Um, you're so generous with your time. I know at the AMNH you you have so many events that you put put so much of your heart into, and your time, and you're so busy. Where now with with new technologies? Where do you get your information? How do you keep up with what's happening all over the world now? Okay, that's a great question. First, um, I have access to a cloning machine, <laughs> so all the times you see me there, that's just that's a holographic clone. Uh, <laughs> So, no, it's, it's very hard, but, so a couple of things. If I want to know something that hit today, I just look at my Twitter stream, and I have enough followers there that they say, what do you think of this? And what do you, have you seen this clip? Many a time, I've been introduced to a YouTube clip of some importance that may have had like 100 views on it. So people, so I feel like this community of people who support what I do are also part of my eyes and ears, my sensory system out there. And that's for sort of, uh, uh, come and go pop culture things. For more scientific uh, uh, discoveries, I have colleagues and their journals and things that, that would be more typical. And my wife, who reads the New York Times every day, she'll just send me links every time I, because I can't scan it and pick the stuff out, but she knows what I need and like. And my kids, they keep me plugged in to anything that anybody under 20 cares about, because that's a whole other, we know, that's a whole other thing going on there. So, so it's multiple sources, but thanks for that question. Let's see, we have some good geeky questions coming in on the phone. Bring them on. 
let's see if I can do it. The uh, technology is a little different down here in the green space, but let's see if I can get Eric from Hackensack on the line here. Eric, we have you. Yeah, I'm here. Hi there. And you're on with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Hey, hey. Yes, it's a great honor here. Um, I have a science question. Um, We know from Professor Hubble that the universe is expanding. The uh, stars are moving away from each other at increasing speeds. We also know that anything that has mass will gain mass as it approaches the speed of light. So will there come a point in the future where these uh, stars will gain so much mass that they'll be forced by the laws of physics to come back into a great big cosmic egg or something? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that, that's a great question. Uh, uh, so in Einstein's relativity, uh, the general theory and special relativity, uh, there's an interesting distinction between something moving through the fabric of space and the fabric of space itself stretching. And so the Hubble expansion that we all know and love, that is the expanding universe discovered by Hubble back in 1929, that uh, has, we've only ever measured the universe to be expanding and it, it is also likely accelerating in that expansion for a mysterious reason, by the way. Um, so if you say, well, what reason is that? I, it's mysterious. <laughs> but but the, uh, when it's the fabric of the universe expanding, you're not going to get this, this increased mass phenomenon that goes on when you are moving through the fabric of space. Um, and, and for this reason, for example, the entire universe can expand faster than the speed of light. So there are no, none of the traditional restrictions that we get moving through space apply to the expansion of space itself. And it may be expanding even more than we have previously realized. Knowing you were coming on today, a friend of mine emailed me this article from the Huffington Post uh, just from yesterday, headline, the universe may hold 10 times more galaxies than we thought. And it says, for decades, astronomers had put the number at 100 billion to 200 billion, but new research using data from the Hubble uh, Space Telescope show and other observatories shows that that number is about 10 times too low. I don't even know how to get my mind around <laughs> the difference between 200 billion galaxies and 10 times that and the implications for us, but you know this? Yeah, so, so um, actually my master's thesis, I predicted there'd be 10 times as many galaxies really? out there in the universe. Um, so I, I have to check on what uh, where they're going with that. I, I made a prediction, but what matters in the end are observations. The, the, uh, it's fun that if there are more galaxies, the, this more is better, I think. Uh, it's, <laughs> galaxies are made of stars. Stars may have planets and people, or at least one of them has people. So, so what, what would be weirder is not if we found more galaxies than we thought, but if we found a different kind of thing out there. So don't be so concerned or have existential angst learning that there are more galaxies than you previously thought. In the universe, generally, we find more of what we thought was there rather than less. Here's a good geeky question from a good geeky town. Linda in Princeton. You're on WNYC. That's for sure a geeky town, yes. Let's see if I can get Linda on the line, if I'm geeky enough to uh, operate this phone box here. And producers, maybe you can help me with this. Get line eight up. And what we can do is... It is work because you're just banging keys on your laptop there. That That's, is what I'm that doing. That doesn't always just get what I'm <laughs> And when I'm in the studio upstairs, that actually works. But, it's, like, uh, it's like the old days with Rabbit Ear TV. You slap the TV on the side. That's some leftover behavior from... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what it is? It's like I go home and tell the family, well, the way I put um, callers on the air is that I just knock the keyboard a few times. A few and they times. say, that can't be true. And I say, come down to the green space and watch. So now that I'm in front of witnesses, of course, it doesn't work. Um, here's, here, here's another thing that, that may or may not work. It's one more clip from Star Talk, mm-hmm. and this is of you and World Science Festival founder Brian Green. Physicist, yeah. And hold on to your conceptual hats, folks, because this is about not knowing what reality we're in as virtual reality technology becomes really, really realistic. If it's the case that one day we can have computers that can recreate a reality in bits and bytes that has such verisimilitude that they're inhabitants of those simulations that feel that it's real, if that's possible, and I think many of us agree that 
It might be. Sure. We're, getting, we're getting closer already. Just let's assume that's possible. It's so much easier to create a simulation than it is to create a real universe. I mean, how are you going to create a real right. universe? Right. So if you wait long enough, there are going to be many, many more simulated universes than there are real ones. So any sentient being, if they're rational, will think that the odds are that they're in one of those simulations because there's so many more of those compared to Just real ones. Statistically, statistically, you're in the simulated one, not the real one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. So get over it. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's uh, consider if you, if you can simulate a world with such precision, he used a bigger syllable word there, verisimilitude, but with such precision and accuracy that you create beings that have entire neurological function uh, bordering on free will, then, then uh, they will just think they're alive. And if they're alive and they have some kind of free will, and they're advanced enough, they might create a simulation within themselves, just to simulate their own universe. And then it'll be simulated universes all the way down. So if you throw a dart at all the universes that exist, as a random choice, we could be simply in one of those. So we could be invented by some kid in his parents' basement, uh, of some alien kids. Uh, and, and this would be, <laughs> completely give us why laws of physics are this way and not some other way. It's because some kid invented it. In their, no, think about, if you play a game, like if you play Mario, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mario jumps and you know, can go off the cliff but then scurry back, the whole laws of physics that apply to the game. If, if I were in that game and curious, I would measure the laws of physics operating in that game. They'd be different from ours because somebody programmed it in. And if you jump off, you can scurry and not fall down and come back to a surface. That's that universe's laws of physics. Would we all need goggles? <laughs> yeah, it, de it depends, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so where anyone who's thought about that problem is pretty much in agreement with it. So, yeah, you can choose to not want it to be true. But, the, like I said, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. Now I think we have Linda in Princeton. Linda, you there? Hello, Brian. Hi there. You're on WNYC with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, Brian and Professor Tyson. Uh, Brian, I'm glad, given your keyboard talents, that you're not operating a nuclear power plant. <laughs> you should be glad. You should definitely be glad. We'll leave that to the Homer Simpsons of the By world. By the way, I knew Professor Hubble's grandson, yeah. Tower, the late Tower Hubble here in Princeton, who was a fabulous person. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, a mathematician friend of mine, Professor, said years ago, uh, when we were talking about this time capsule that had apparently been sent somewhere with Beatles tunes and music and art and mm -hmm. literature, that the one sure way of establishing whether there was, quote, intelligent life somewhere else in the universe, if not here, would be indicating uh, the existence of the concept of prime numbers. And if another being recognized that, it would indicate that their intelligence had advanced you know, remarkably or sufficiently. Could you answer that? And I'll take my answer off the air. Prime numbers, if I remember yeah, my high you. school math, being those that are only divisible by themselves and by one. Is that uh, correct? Evenly divisible by themselves. All numbers are divisible by all numbers, but they have to be evenly divisible. Yeah, to hold numbers. With no remainder at the yes. end, yes. <laughs> then you'd have a prime number. Right. Uh, so uh, I say that because in the movie Little Man Tate, uh, this genius, you know, elementary school kid, uh, the teacher asks, um, you know, is this number divisible? Which of these n numbers is divisible by three? And uh, he said, they all are. And right. the teacher meant evenly divisible, but she didn't say it. And so the kid was beyond the teacher's thinking. So, so uh, yes, so. Because <laughs> so the just, kid invented the teacher. You just <laughs> demonstrated. Exactly. <laughs> so, so probably the caller is thinking about the Voyager record, which was an affixed, um, bit of information and, uh, and actually a record player that contains sounds of our species. Uh, Andrian was the creative director of that, who um, uh, co-wrote both Cosmoses, the first and the, uh, with Carl Sagan and the one that I had the privilege of hosting a couple of years ago. And so she's a very creative person and thinks deeply about culture and civilization and our future. And so they thought a lot about what information you'd put on there but it had to be encoded in a way so that an alien would have some chance of knowing what you're giving them. You can't write it in English. They're not going to speak English or French or, or Esperanto, right? Or is that what's what they call it, Esperanto? 
Esperanto. Esper- Esperanto, thank you. Um, so, so you have to be creative, and you have to ask, what language is universal? Truly universal, not just Earth-wide. We so abuse the word universe on Earth. Miss Universe, no, she's Miss Earth, okay? <laughs> just get that straight, okay? <laughs> just please, all right. She's so, misabused by the owner going backstage <laughs> and walking through the dressing room. So the universe, the language of the universe is mathematics because it applies everywhere that we see and the laws of physics that, 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 that gird it. So if you wanna communicate with aliens, you probably would wanna do it in some mathematical way and prime numbers would be evidence that they have not only figured out how to talk to the universe, because math is that language, but maybe we could find a way for us to talk with one another. Well, guess what? We will have to leave it there for talking with one another for oh, this time. You, you left 15 minutes for us to talk about the whole universe? This universe. This. <laughs> we'll do a half hour next time, and we'll talk about a couple of others, too. Neil okay. deGrasse Tyson, director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Thank Museum you. of Natural Thank History and host of the podcast and National Geographic Channel TV show, Star Talk, which now has an accompanying book, and co-author with fellow astrophysicists Michael Strauss and J. Richard Gott of the new book, Welcome to the Universe, an Astrophysical Tour. And I'll just... Welcome to the Universe. you got to say it right. You you say it. Yeah, Welcome to the Universe. Yeah, okay. I'm not even going to (laughs) try. And I'll just add that the episode of Star Talk featuring Brian Green premieres this Monday, October 17th at 11... 10 Central on National Geographic Channel. And for more information about the show, you can visit natgeotv.com, natgeotv.com. Dr. Tyson, thanks again. Thanks for having me. Everybody.